Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. Every now and again, we see demonstrated a fairly interesting phenomenon when it comes to media. This occurs in pretty much all forms of media. But of course, being a gaming-centric channel, we want to focus on when it happens when it comes to video games. And that is the disconnect between critical opinion and the opinion of the average gamer. It's perhaps a bit of a misnomer to categorize anything as an average gamer opinion because there really is no such thing as an average gamer. But if we were to look at, say, aggregate scores, for instance, things start to become a little bit clearer. I'm certainly not the biggest fan of scores, and I will no doubt criticize them by the end of this video as I have a tendency to do whenever I mention them, but the game in question this time around is Mad Max, and there seems to be a massive rift between some of the more prominent critical opinion, not all, but some, and the opinion of gamers in general based on aggregate information from, say, Steam's user reviews. Mad Max currently sits at 94% positive reviews on Steam, which is of course very high, with over 5,000 user reviews of the product. However, on Metacritic it sits at a not-so-healthy 70, with several outlets giving it a fairly low score. So what exactly happened there? Has it happened before? Why is it happening? And who's right on this one, is the question. Well, you may be a little bit disappointed by that because, spoiler alert, I'm going to claim that neither of these groups are wrong, but let's talk a little bit about why exactly this has happened. We're going to focus on three of the most critical reviews of Mad Max. Jim Sterling's review, Polygon's review, and GameSpot's review. Before we do that, though, has this kind of thing happened before? Well, there's often a disconnect between the critics and the user base in general, but it's usually the other way around. More often than not, you see a title that is highly reviewed on aggregate with high scores across the board, but the user score will be much, much lower than that. The thing is that this user score is very misleading. More often than not, the games which have the biggest gulf between the aggregate critical opinion and the aggregate user score on a site like Metacritic are this way because of so-called review bombing. Now, the idea behind this is that if the game has done something particularly egregious, a large number of users may rate the game as low as possible in order to try and hurt the title in some way or protest again in some way. Ineffectual? Probably. I know very few people that take the Metacritic user scores seriously in any way, but there are plenty of games that have this big gap. I mean, a prime example is Modern Warfare 2, which got a meta score of 86. However, its average user score around the time of its release was 37 or 3.7. That's, of course, a massive difference. And the question is, well, why is that? Was Modern Warfare 2 a bad game? Well, no, it was primarily due to the issues with the PC port of the game, which removed things like dedicated servers, comments that you didn't need chat or anything along those lines from the developers, and overall arrogance from Infinity Ward, which led various people to get very, very upset about this, and of course it generated a boycott group of the title. Dragon Age 2 is perhaps a little bit more of an interesting case, where you have an average meta score of 82 with a user score of 3.9 around the time of the game's release. In this example, it's less due to decisions made by the developer and more due to an inexplicable gap between what the critics thought on aggregate and what the users thought, and I tend to side with the users on this one. I found Dragon Age 2 to be incredibly dull, and there are a wide variety of reasons for that, not least of which the insistence on reused locations, a complete lack of epic sweeping storyline, and frankly a rushed game with poor combat, ridiculous respawning enemy mechanics, and all that sort of thing. But the amount of positive reviews this game got from the critics is absolutely massive. And indeed, I think the most infamous of it was probably the review from PC Gamer, which was heavily criticized for really missing the point for the most part. There are plenty of games that do this, but it's fairly rare to find a game that goes to a very extreme extent in the other direction. Every now and again, you'll get one that maybe has a cult following, like Deadly Premonition, for instance. Users like that more than reviews did, but the gap between the scores is a lot smaller.
Killing Floor didn't really set the critics' world on fire, but users really enjoyed it, and it became an extremely popular game that still has a very large community to this day. And every once in a while, you'll find a game that perhaps the critics don't really get. For instance, some of the earlier Monster Hunter games that were incredibly highly rated by users, but not as highly rated by the critics. But we're not talking about really poor scores here. We're talking... For Freedom, for instance, on average 71 from the critics, whereas it was 91 from the users. That's not a particularly large gap. Although every now and again, you do get a game like, say, God Hand, where the outlying critical review is so incredibly out of left field and so utterly out of touch with everything else that it stands out like a sore thumb. IGN, of course, giving that game a three, which earned them much ridicule since that game, for most people, is considered a cult classic and was also reviewed very well at the time by other sites. Such is the case with Mad Max. Mad Max was not badly reviewed. Its aggregate score is 70. That is considered to be mixed on Metacritic because, of course, the score system for games has a tendency of trending higher than perhaps it should be. Most sites don't really use the whole score scale, and on average, if a game gets anything less than an 8, it's considered by many people to be junk. How ridiculous that is, well, I've explained that time and time and time again. But what you see with the critical response to Mad Max is an interesting spread. You do have plenty of 90s, you've got some solid mid-80s as well, including large outlets like IGN. But then you have some lower scores. The Jimquisition giving it the lowest, that being 4 out of 10. Polygon giving it 5 out of 10. And GameSpot giving it 6 out of 10. And there are plenty of middling reviews for this game. Not too many bad ones, in fact Jim's is the only one considered by, bad by Metacritic, but plenty of middling reviews. So, what went wrong here, exactly? Who, who is right? Who is wrong on this? Are the critics just out of touch? Are users completely clueless when it comes to what they actually want? Well, as usual, the answer is a little bit more complicated than that. So, let's have a look at a few of these critical reviews. We're going to start with Jim's. Now, Jim's review focuses for the most part on the amount of busy work that the game actually offers. In fact, he uses the term repetitive busy work and goes on to describe the game as drowning its player in endless scarecrows to tear down, snipers to kill, encampments to dismantle and scavenging posts to loot, none of it compelling in the least. Now, this is a common theme across all of the critical reviews. Polygon mentions it in great detail. GameSpot also mentions it, although they do focus quite a lot more on the mechanics and the combat system. And an article from Ars Technica, which I view as reasonably egregious because it uses a very clickbaity kind of title. It says, whatever you're looking for in a Mad Max game, Mad Max isn't it, which is evidently not the case based on user reviews. Also criticizes, again, the amount of busy work and the amount of pointless activities that the game has to offer. This is a common theme. Now, do I agree with that? Well, I'm about 10 hours into Mad Max up to this point. I haven't finished playing it yet. I don't feel like I've got a good enough grasp to do a video as of yet. But so far, I actually have to agree with those reviews. The game is buried in a lot of open-world-esque busy work. At the recent DragonCon podcast, I talked a little bit about Mad Max. And I said the best way to describe it is open-world game, the open-world game. It's pretty much ticking every possible box when it comes to what an open world game has to provide in the modern 2015 gaming scene. It is doing things that plenty of other open world games have done already and seem to be becoming standards for the genre. Now, whether or not that's a good thing, that is entirely up to your personal perspective. Because while I do agree that there's a lot of busy work and there are a lot of tasks which have very limited context and don't really have any impact on the story progression or anything along those lines, there's no real narrative to support any of it. That's still fun for a great deal of people. That's still content for a great deal of people. The thing about an open world game is that more often than not, that world is filled with distractions. And those distractions end up taking you perhaps on an unexpected journey. And the strongest open world games are those that are able to use these preset distractions to lead you into an area of emergent gameplay. So, for instance, you are following a distraction, you see something on the map, it's like, ah, I want to go pick up this secret thing, and then you come across a fight, a, a battle between rebels and locals or something along those lines, and you end up getting involved in some way, and the combat plays out, and yes, 
there's no narrative impetus to be involved in any of this, but that's not really the point, because games aren't necessarily about the narrative that the game has dictated to you. They're about the narrative that you yourself create in those little moments. Games are about allowing you to tell a personal story within the confines and the mechanics of the world, and that to me is when games are strongest. And when games try to take that away from you and impose their own narrative unnecessarily, as I have criticized certain games in the emergent walking simulator genre for in the past, I feel that they're missing the point. I feel that they're not fully taking advantage of the medium. Now, Mad Max has those moments. You can head on over to try and loot a scrap pile and come across a group of bandits. You can stumble across a group of wanderers who you can give water to to try and save their lives, and in return they may reveal a hidden area for you, and of course, thank you for doing so. You may run across a wanderer who is digging up scrap, and they will say, hey, you can help me out. They'll give you a little bit of story background as to why they're out there. And of course, they'll give you the choice of helping them out with the scrap or killing them entirely to grab the scrap for yourself. It's really up to you. And those little parts of the game are perhaps not grand sweeping narratives. They're not incredible examples of storytelling, but they are little moments. And you'll find that a great deal of gamers actually do appreciate that in their open world games. And a lot of what makes the open world game entertaining for them is the ability to stumble across such things. So what is represented as busy work in many of these reviews is in fact for many people entertaining gameplay. What critics might describe as pointless busy work and padding, many gamers might describe as a bunch of stuff to do and plenty of content. And neither of them are wrong because really what you value in content is entirely personal. A lot of people are very much okay with repetitive gameplay. They just want things to do. I mean, if you've ever played World of Warcraft, you're probably intimately familiar with the concept of repetitive questing, and yet it is content there, and it is, strangely enough, what many critics actually praised the game for 10 years ago when it first came out. Now, of course, the tides have perhaps changed a little bit, and critics are may be more critical of that kind of repetitive questing content these days. But back then, it was compelling, and it still is compelling for a great number of people. Are the critics wrong? No. Unless, of course, they're making grandiose claims like whatever you're looking for in a Mad Max game, Mad Max isn't it. Which is obviously, again, not the case, as we've seen from thousands of Steam user reviews. So what else has been criticized? Well, the combat on foot is often mentioned as a problem. If we head on over to Polygon's review, for instance, they accurately point out that it's a rhythm-based affair borrowed from recent Batman games. The Batman Arkham style of combat is something that plenty of games have borrowed to greater or lesser extent when it comes to success. I think one of the games that was most successful at borrowing it was probably Shadow of Mordor. That did a pretty damn good job of it. And there are other games which used fairly similar rhythm-based combat systems such as Remember Me. Not quite the same, but it's definitely got some elements that can be compared to Batman, and then games that used it very, very poorly, such as Kick-Ass, for instance. Now, more often than not, when critics see the same kind of combat system used over and over and over again, they will progressively start to criticize it and dislike it because they're sick of the lack of innovation. It also becomes more apparent the more often a particular combat system or mechanic is used as to whether or not it's actually flawed. The first time something like that would be brought into play, it often impresses critics because it's something a little bit different and they're perhaps bedazzled by this new style of doing things. Arkham Asylum is a prime example of that. The game's combat was praised repeatedly. And yet, now that it's being used by other games, it's becoming more apparent as to what the flaws of that combat system are. For instance, the combat system really doesn't have a great deal of depth. Most of the combat system goes solely down to your ability to hit the block button and counter button at the right time. Everything else is flashy, cinematic, yet lacking any real sense of combat depth. And yet... A lot of gamers really like it. I stumbled across a thread on the GameSpot forums, indeed, about a year ago, in regards to Arkham Combat, love it or hate it. 82% of those that voted in that thread said it's awesome, and 18% said it was lame. And here's a few comments from users. It's far better than any other typical action God of War clone. Far better. So that's somebody saying that the typical spectacle fighter style of combat, which 
frankly contains a great deal more depth and a much better learning curve from games such as God of War and Devil May Cry is in fact worse than the Arkham style of combat. Said user goes on to say that how can people say it's dull? Which action games do you think have better combat? Of course, a reply from one of those users says, well, Bayonetta, Devil May Cry 3, Wonderful 101, Ninja Gaiden Black, DMC4, Adaki Reigns, Metal Gear Rising, God Hand, and so on and so forth. Of course, one of the responses to that is, Bayonetta, I never played it. Devil May Cry, I never played it. <laughs> Ninja Gaiden Black, now that is the definition of shallow. This is the thing, isn't it? A lot of people really just don't understand game mechanics all that much, and what they enjoy is extremely subjective and often based on familiarity. They'll stumble across a combat system that perhaps they're reasonably competent at, that perhaps they enjoy the look of, and as a result, they will come to conclude that this is the best way of doing things, whereas that may simply not be the case, and it's often based on ignorance. I mean, claiming, for instance, that Ninja Gaiden Black is the definition of shallow combat in action games is absolutely bonkers. But while he may be objectively wrong on that subject, he's not objectively wrong when he said, hey, Arkham is the best way of doing things. And the success of the Arkham games and the response from players has made it abundantly clear that yes, actually, they do rather enjoy that particular system. Now, having played almost every game that includes this system, I must admit that I am getting sick of it. And as somebody that does really enjoy the more traditional spectacle fighter style from Bayonetta, Devil May Cry, God of War, and so on and so forth, I do find those systems particularly shallow. However, you can't deny its effectiveness as an entry-level combat system that makes the player feel like they're doing really, really well. It deliberately rewards you with excellent visual feedback when you nail everything. Even Mad Max does the same thing with perfect parries and the combo stringing system and the fury system as your moves get more brutal as you continue to chain moves together. And yet if you look at it from a critical standpoint, you'd say, yeah, this system is actually really quite shallow. And Polygon continues to criticize it, saying that you really don't have many tools at your disposal during fights, which is absolutely true. You really do not. Admittedly, Batman also has similar issues, but even Batman has a great deal more stuff you can do with gadgets. Mad Max's on-foot combat is very much reliant on whether or not you enjoy that rhythm-based pounding. And if you don't, then you will absolutely get bored of that, particularly bearing in mind that the game forces you to do it. Mad Max is a curious case because in Arkham Knight, the game was criticized frequently for its overuse of the Batmobile. In Mad Max, this game is criticized for on-foot combat. In fact, the game plays a lot better, at least in my view and the view of the critics as well, when you are behind the wheel of a car. So it is the opposite of Arkham Knight, and yet the same problem occurs. You want to be fighting one way, and yet the game deliberately forces you to fight in another, which is not as enjoyable and doesn't have that degree of depth. And yet, thousands upon thousands of gamers are expressing their delight at this combat system and saying they're really enjoying it. So, as we continue to dig further into this, we start to come across perhaps the core issue of the disconnect between the critical response and the response of the gamer. And there's a particular quote from Jim's review that I think maybe inadvertently strikes at the heart of it. When he describes the massive map with repetitive busywork, he goes on to say it may display a facsimile of value to its audience. And that's it, isn't it? There lies the biggest possible disconnect between a professional critic and the user themselves. And this does not just apply to games by any stretch of the imagination. I'd like to bring up the example of the Transformers movies. Now, these movies have been repeatedly criticized for being, well, awful, at least by the critics at any rate. Transformers Age of Extinction got an incredibly low 32 Metacritic score. Revenge of the Fallen received 35. Indeed, the only Transformers movie to receive a positive Metacritic score on aggregate was, in fact, the original, with Dark of the Moon getting a middling 42. And yet... These movies made a ton of money. Why? You might ask yourself. Well, why exactly did these movies make a ton of money? Why is it that even number four, which was panned by pretty much everybody, ended up making $1.1 billion at the box office? How did that happen? 
How does a movie that gets such a low aggregate score from pretty much every critic on the planet make $1.1 billion? Well, it comes down to a couple of things. And one of those, I think, is very relevant to the topic we just discussed, the combat system, and that is the idea of familiarity. It's the idea of safety. And that's the big difference between a professional critic and just the average consumer. A professional critic is often in pursuit of the new. They're often looking for the next big thing. They're looking for something that advances the medium in some way. And as a result, they may value innovation perhaps more than the consumer does. And oddly enough, as much as we hear people crying out for innovation and crying out for change, that is often not representative of the consumer base as a whole and its purchasing power as a whole. Call of Duty is a prime example of this. This is a franchise that comes out on a year-by-year -year basis and is frequently criticized loudly by gamers for just doing the same thing over and over again. And there are thread upon thread upon thread demanding that this game change itself and innovate and actually advance itself. And yet, when the game actually does this with something like Advanced Warfare, the player base as a whole sometimes reacts poorly to that. And these games continue to sell incredibly well, regardless of whether or not there are any really big changes made. And why is that? Well, a lot of it comes down to the fact that you have to pay $60 for a video game. Critics don't have to do that. Cost isn't really considered too much of a factor. I mean, a lot of us try to talk about the relative value of the game. We'll talk about how much content there is available, but... When it comes to personal value, if we're not buying our games, then our perspective is always going to be a little bit different. And if we're the sort of people that are just buried in titles and can never possibly finish all of the games that we're given, we end up in a situation where we have a fundamentally different view as to what is valuable content and what is not. With Mad Max's combat system, at least on foot, what you have is a very safe, tried and true combat system that has been proven to work and has been proven popular amongst a wide variety of people. Not only that, but it's been proven popular in the same genre that Mad Max currently resides in, that of the open world action game. It worked well in Batman, it worked well in Shadow of Mordor, and those games sold very, very well. So why on earth would Mad Max not? use that tried and true method. And as we've seen, it has resonated with the kind of people that enjoy open world action games and that expect certain things from these open world action games. Now, when it comes down to the idea of busy work and this so-called facsimile of valuable content, for a critic, all of this is busy work, no doubt about it. You know, do I really want to drive around collecting little bits of scrap? Do I really wish to drive around knocking over scarecrow posts and doing all of these little side activities and unlocking outposts and so on and so forth? Not especially because I'm looking to try and get to the heart of it. I'm looking to try and get to the meat and figure out exactly how far this game can really go. And that content is deliberately getting in my way of doing that. And yet, for the gamer, that's providing them with hours and hours and hours of entertainment because they don't want to blast through their games quickly. They're spending $60. They want what they view as value for money. And a lot of people view value for money as a dollar per hour ratio. Now, for me, that's not the case. I view it as very much a ratio of quality hours versus filler hours. I would prefer a short game that's two hours in length that is all killer and no filler, as opposed to a game that is 30, 40 hours in length and maybe five hours of that content is really good and the rest of it is sort of middling and busy work and trying to pass the time and pad the game out. That's the big difference, I think, between the consumer there and the critic. Now, why did I bring up the example of Transformers? Because this is perhaps one of the biggest budget cases of this in action. This idea that consumers move to the safe and they move to the tried and true as opposed to necessarily taking risks. With Transformers, you know exactly what you're going to get before you go in. You're going to get a dumb plot, you're going to get a lot of explosions, and you're going to get big stompy robots. And for a lot of people, that is all they want. That's all they need. Because they're spending money on a cinema ticket, they want to be entertained in a particular, familiar way for two hours, or in the case of Age of Extinction, far bloody longer than that. And they want to leave knowing that they got to see exactly what they expected to. They went in, and they got what they wanted out of the experience. 
Now, if you want proof that this is the case, particularly when it comes to movies, you need only look at the phenomenon of spoiling key plot points in trailers. This is something that the internet likes to get upset about, and I'm not a particular fan of it either, for obvious reasons. And yet, the experts in this particular topic, the people that actually make these trailers, have genuine grounds to believe that spoiling these key plot points is actually good for business. There was a quote here from Matt Brubaker. He's the president of Theatrical at Trailer Park, which is the agency that created the trailer for Southpaw, which is the boxing movie. Now, I'm not going to spoil this particular plot point for you, but here's the quote. There was a lot of discussion internally whether to show the death of blank. Won't tell you what that is in the trailer for Southpaw, but it was decided to show more of the good, so to speak. People have felt burned in the past. If someone's going to pay $20 to go on opening weekend to see this movie, they want to know they're making a good investment. As much as people complain that trailers give away too much, nine times out of 10, the more of the plot you give away, the more interest you garner from the audiences. Audiences respond to the trailers with more of the movie. This is by no means an outlying opinion. Mark Wallen, who also created trailers for The Social Network and Boyhood, confirms that yes, audiences seem to prefer spoilers. Another example is Terminator Genesis. I was particularly upset by the fact that they spoiled a key plot point in the trailer for that and actually didn't go to see it as a result. And yet, that film made $208 million in its opening weekend. So evidently that didn't drive too many people away, perhaps quite the opposite. The risk, of course, is that the trailer may not represent the film correctly. It may lead to unreasonable or incorrect expectations, which can result in audience disappointment. And of course, if a movie appears too mysterious and doesn't give you a good enough idea of what you're going to see, people may avoid seeing it entirely. And why? It's because they have to pay for it. They have to spend the money to do that. The cinema is not a cheap experience. Gaming, by comparison, maybe has a larger financial outlay, but more often than not, you get more entertainment per dollar per hour than you would from a movie. And I am going to speculate here that gamers also enjoy this idea of familiarity and safety when it comes to putting money down, especially considering that they are so often burned. There are perhaps some examples of games that have not necessarily intentionally misled audiences, but have led to different expectations from the consumer, which has resulted in disappointment from some people. For instance, Gone Home gave the idea to some people prior to its release that it was a mystery and that it indeed may very well be a horror experience. And yet, of course, it turned out to be nothing of the sort. And some people were entirely okay with that, and some others absolutely were not. And that's what happens when you deliberately obfuscate the nature of the game in order to try and avoid spoilers. And as much as people say we don't want spoilers, as we have seen before, as it turns out, some people certainly do. I think with games, though, it's a little bit different to movies. For instance, with movies, if we go by what these people have said, then the familiarity and the safety offered by plot spoilers in trailers is beneficial to the audience. A lot of the audience reacts positively to that because they know what they're getting into. With games, it's less about the plot points, and you'll find that a lot of people are very militant about avoiding those plot spoilers, and it's more about mechanical familiarity, because a game can have a terrible plot and still be extremely enjoyable to play, whereas a movie with a terrible plot is generally not all that enjoyable to watch, unless, of course, it's extremely flashy and has some awesome action sequences. So it's a little different, but the principle remains the same. So as a result, when you put out an open world game like Mad Max that is ticking all the boxes, that's a safe buy for a lot of people. And as a result, they react by saying, yeah, I actually really enjoyed this. This is good value for money. This is exactly what I was hoping it would be. This is exactly what I was expecting. I've enjoyed games like this in the past. I'm enjoying this game. I feel like I got my money's worth. And that's it, isn't it? That's the big difference. I, as a critic, am not concerned about whether or not I got my money's worth. If you look at these reviews, it tells the story. Polygon at the bottom of their review said that it was reviewed using non-final PlayStation 4 debug code provided by Warner Brothers. If we head on over to GameSpot, you'll see exactly the same thing. It was done with review code. I mean, it was reviewed prior to the game's release. That's the only way that could have happened. I don't believe they disclosed it, but it's obvious that that is the case. Even in the case of Jim Sterling's review, where he actually purchased the game, 
it's a bit different when you're a critic and you're buying it to work on it. It's a necessary expense. It's a business expense. It's like buying office supplies. You need to do it. It's not that you're buying it out of a desire to purchase it. You don't really have that emotional investment in the purchase as you would with a consumer. You just buy it and you accept that it is a fact of the business. It is a necessary business expense. I really do believe this is what a lot of the disconnect between the critics and the users when it comes to Mad Max comes down to. There are a few other things that reviews generally don't touch on all that much, and it's mostly down to the fact that a lot of these guys get their review code on console and not on PC. On PC in particular, I know that a great deal of people will pursue games that run well and look really good, and Mad Max is that. It's one of the best PC versions for a AAA game that I've seen in years. It runs exceptionally well, it looks absolutely fantastic, and a lot of the little issues like the control problems are of course potentially solved on PC, where you can rebind all the buttons. So that becomes less of a factor. Since many outlets don't review on PC and sometimes even when they do they don't really talk a great deal about the PC performance or factor it into their overall score, you'll find that the people that appreciate a really good looking game that runs really well on PC are not well represented by these reviews that don't even discuss anything like that. Again, that often comes down to value for money. If you're a PC power user, you want a game that looks great and runs really, really well. And yes, that does enhance your experience a great deal. As much as some ill-informed folks might like to say that frame rate is about how good the game looks and that graphics don't matter over gameplay, in reality, frame rate is an integral part of how good the gameplay actually is. And Mad Max running as smoothly as it does certainly makes the game more enjoyable. There's no real doubt about that. Indeed, in the case of Polygon's review, they actually did a side box out that claimed the opposite, that the game didn't run very well because it was on a debug PS4, whereas I ran it on a PC with high spec and the game runs like an absolute dream. It's one of the best looking and highest performance games that I own. And yeah, that does factor in quite a bit. It factors more into consumer purchases than it often does into critical reviews. But here's the question I suppose I have to ask in conclusion. Is it really a problem? that these critics did not rate the game all that highly. Is that affecting your personal enjoyment of the game? And more to the point, when you read these reviews, are you looking at what they actually say? Or are you looking at how they actually rate it? Because when I've seen the complaints from gamers on forums and subreddits about the way that the critics have handled this, it's more often than not focused on the number. And this is a truth that has occurred time and time and time again. If GameSpot's review didn't have a 6 at the bottom, if Polygon's review didn't have a 5 and Jim's didn't have a 4, then one has to wonder if there would be anywhere near the apparent outcry at the way that these critics have actually handled this game. Because has anything they've said within their reviews actually been proven false? Well, based on my experience, not really, no. Is Jim right when he says the game is stocked full of busy work? Absolutely. Is Polygon right when they say that the combat is a repetitive rhythm-based affair borrowed from Batman games that doesn't really change? Absolutely. Are they right when they mention that there are no really meaningful female characters in the game? Which is a little bit out of place considering that Fury Road had plenty of them. So it would be a little bit weird for a Mad Max game not to include them. Yes, they are. There, there aren't many. But the problem is when you put a score at the end. Because all of those things, you as a consumer can read and come to the conclusion that none of it matters to you. Absolutely none of it. For you, what a critic claims is pointless busy work could very well be hours and hours of enjoyable content. For you, what a critic claims is a repetitive and familiar combat system could very well be the one that you've enjoyed in previous titles and want to play again. And that's the great thing about critique. You can use your own standards, compare them to the critics, and then come to the conclusion as to whether or not the critics' complaints, or indeed what the critic enjoys, matches up to what you like. And that, I think, is why it's really important to read fairly widely. Not just read the reviews and critiques of people who have opinions that line up with yours. I mean, that is useful, don't get me wrong. 
If you happen to be an aficionado for a particular genre, it may behoove you to read reviews and watch videos from somebody else who is also really into that genre. That's very useful, but simultaneously, that doesn't mean that reviews from the opposing point of view aren't useful. In fact, they're extremely useful yard indicators. They are markers by which you can determine how much you enjoy the game based on your own personal preferences. It all falls apart when you add a score to that, because at that point you are essentially trying to quantify a game with an arbitrary number, which is represented in a pseudo-objective fashion. Now, is that your fault as a reviewer? Not necessarily. I mean, I really think it's down to Metacritic culture. It claims that a certain number means good and a certain number means bad. And at that point, it is creating this appearance of objectivity where really none exists. Score is just as subjective, if not more so, than the opinions contained within the review itself. And to me, the score is useless. And to me, in this instance, the gulf of opinion is represented very clearly with the scores themselves. Not to blow my own trumpet here, but I think really that's why my format works better. Showing a large chunk of the game with a great deal of commentary explaining why I believe each little piece of the game to be good or bad based on my own personal preferences, which I clearly disclose, I think is far more useful. Hey, hell, you could mute my commentary and you would still find value from that video because you would see elements of the gameplay that you would perhaps enjoy and elements that you would not. You don't even need to listen to what I'm saying to still get a good idea of what that game has to offer to you. So who's right? Well, everybody is. You're not wrong to enjoy Mad Max. I enjoy Mad Max to a certain degree, but I still share many of the criticisms that have been leveled at it by these other critics, not all of them. And I'll enjoy explaining that once I finally get around to doing the big video on it. But they're not wrong. They just view those things with a greater or lesser degree of importance than your average consumer would. Does that mean that reviews aren't useful to the consumer anymore? Well, I think there's always been that element. And for years now, this is not a recent occurrence. Yes, there may have been controversy, particularly over the last year, as to how some games are reviewed and the priorities of certain reviewers relative to the general consumer base, but this has really always been the case to a greater or lesser extent. Critics are always going to have a different point of view, and they're always going to be looking for specific things that perhaps you as the consumer don't really care about. But the key takeaway is this. That doesn't make any of these pieces of content useless. Far from it. What you need to do is to treat these pieces of content as useful information as opposed to the strength of the reviewer's opinion. It's not a case of this reviewer says it's bad, so I should believe it's bad. It's a case of this reviewer says it's bad, let's try and find out why and see if in my position, I too would come to that conclusion. And that's of course why it's important that reviews and videos have a great deal of detail about them and why these short reviews and indeed scores in general are utterly worthless because they are not yardsticks that you can use to determine whether or not your experience is going to be the same. As a gamer, I would urge you not to be afraid of bad reviews, not to be afraid of the notion that something that you say pre-ordered or picked up on day one or whatever is not liked by other people. Unfortunately, a lot of gamers do engage in confirmation bias, especially when they get involved in pre-order culture, because they want to read things which validate their decision. They don't want to read things which go against it, and more often than not, they end up reacting badly to that, because they can't be wrong in their minds. You know, there's an element of cognitive dissonance there. They're saying, you know, did I make an incorrect decision? That's a very upsetting thing to a lot of people. We don't want to think that we're wrong. We don't want to think that we did something stupid. It's often hard to accept that. We're not wired to think that way. And I think that's where a lot of this controversy comes from. And I think that's why there's a lot of hostility that's leveled towards reviews that give low scores for games that are perhaps otherwise well-liked. But we don't need to do that. We can be better than that. We can learn to disconnect the emotional from the factual. We can learn to disconnect the opinion of somebody else from our own. We can learn to look at that perspective and realize that it helps us form our own opinion, even if we disagree with everything they say.
And that's why it's so very, very important never to engage in echo chamber-like behavior and not just to pursue things that agree with you. Read widely, read things that you don't agree with because you will find that you are able to form a better impression of the product that way or form a better and more educated opinion on a particular issue. This doesn't just apply to media and video games. This applies to things as important as politics. Don't just listen to the people that happen to affiliate with your political point of view. Listen to the people that don't. Put your own opinions to the test. There is huge value in disagreement. Something that perhaps the internet in some areas has forgotten. There is huge value in it. It's vitally important. So if there are any of you currently listening in the audience that have somehow got this far, that are the kind of people that would yell at GameSpot for giving something a poor score or whatever, then before you do it the next time, just, just have a think, you know, just try and stop yourself and think, well, really, what am I yelling about? What part of me has been invalidated as a result of this other guy on the internet? Is this really worth getting upset over? And do I really want every games outlet to write exactly the same thing? Do I really want reviews that only agree with my point of view? Really, what use is that? And if I had any advice for critics from my lowly position as just another YouTuber, I would say that be a little bit more careful when it comes to your condemnation. Don't be like Ars Technica when you say that whatever you're looking for in a Mad Max game, Mad Max isn't it. The sheer arrogance of such a claim, the faux authority of such a thing, flying in the face of the many, many people that do actually believe that this is exactly what they were looking for from a Mad Max game. Do try and pursue objectivity. Do try and put yourself into somebody else's shoes. It's impossible to achieve full objectivity when it comes to critique, but the pursuit of it is always valuable. The idea that someone may think differently to you, or indeed that you're creating a piece of content that's not just for yourself, it's for your audience that may have a fundamentally different perspective based on the fact that, no, they don't get free games all the time, and actually, yes, they're totally fine with familiar experiences, and they're not necessarily looking for the next brand new innovative thing. Don't dismiss those ideas, it's valuable. Those are real, legitimate opinions from the consumers, and... Why are we here if not to help them? I would have to wonder. Unless your critic is purely academic and I can assure you that no, it is not. Absolutely it is not. Then your critique needs to provide a service. And if it doesn't, well, don't be surprised if people go elsewhere. Well, that was far too many words on the subject of why some people don't like Mad Max and some people do. There you go. I'll knock my video together on this particular game a little bit later on in the week, most likely. But thanks for listening, if you actually got this far. What are you doing with your life? My name's been Total Biscuit, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.